Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second event in Duke Law School's Racial Justice Film Series. My name is Ann Gordon, and I'm a clinical professor here at Duke. This film series has been coordinated by Professor Kate Evans and me, with special thanks to Lauren Maxey, Rachel Greeson, and Isabel Fox. Please also mark your calendars for November 5th, where we will be discussing the film Just Mercy, a dramatization of Brian Stevenson's award-winning book by the same name as he fights for justice on Alabama's death row. That night will feature a discussion with Robert Singalese, an attorney at the Durham, Defenders, uh, Durham Capital Defender's Office, excuse me, and Olivia Enzine, who is an attorney at the ACLU's Capital Punishment Project. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Lee Gallant to you all tonight. Lee is a lawyer at the ACLU's national office in New York. He is widely recognized as one of the country's leading public interest lawyers and has argued dozens of groundbreaking civil rights cases during his career, including in the US Supreme Court and virtually every federal court of appeals in the country. He's also testified before both houses of Congress. During the past four years, he's successfully argued some of the country's most hope high profile cases, including a challenge to the Trump administration's unprecedented practice of separating families at the border, something I've witnessed firsthand, and the administration's first and second asylum bans, and the administration's first travel ban as well. Lee has won numerous awards for his work, regularly lectures around the country, and frequently appears in the national and international media. In addition to his work at the ACLU as the director of the Immigrants' Rights Project, he is an adjunct professor at Columbia Law School and for several years was a visiting professor at Yale Law School. The discussion with Lee will be moderated by Kate Evans, who leads Duke Law's Immigrant Rights Clinic. Before coming to Duke, Kate directed the Immigrant Immigration Litigation and Appellate Clinic at the University of Idaho College of Law, where she also taught immigration law and policy. She earlier completed a teaching fellowship at the University of Minnesota Law School's Binger Center for New Americans, and before that earned her JD from NYU Law School, where she was re the recipient of a Ruth Tilden Kern Scholarship for Public Interest and was inducted to the Order of the Coif. Evans' scholarship has been published in the Minnesota Law Review, Brooklyn Law Review, NYU Law, law Review, of, uh, Review of Law and Social Change, and several practitioner-oriented publications as well. Thank you both for being here tonight. Um, for making these connections and, and bringing all of these pieces together. And I'm really so excited to speak with you today, Lee, in the world of immigrant rights litigation. Um, sometimes we get, we feel a little beaten down and the, the work of the ACLU has been a much needed source of inspiration. Um, I got to watch the, the film, The Fight, last night and uh, was reminded why I became committed to this work in, in law school and why in the long run I'm so delighted to, to continue doing it. Um, we wanted to take advantage of your time to kind of cover three main areas. You know, first, some of the litigation efforts, you know, that we're hearing about in the news, um, you know, still constantly um, and get your, your insights and, and a little bit of the, the inside story about how those cases came about um, and what's going on now. Um, second, you, uh, sort of related to that is, is you know, how does the ACLU um, choose cases and think about working within broader movements around racial justice, um, including immigrant rights, um, especially as those movements build and expand, um, thankfully so right now. And then third, I'm a member of our public interest and pro bono committee um, and our, our public interest and pro bono office is co-sponsoring this along with the office of the Dean and about a gazillion more um, groups within the law school, uh, as well as the Sanford School of Public Policy, the Keenan Center for Ethics. And so we all care a lot about um, uh, inspiring our own students to engage in public interest and, and for us public interest lawyering. Um, this discussion is also part of the course that, that Ann Gordon and, and Professor Jesse McCoy lead on social justice lawyering. So we also wanted to take some time to, to talk with you about your career as a public interest lawyer and make sure you, know, you could share advice um, about your experience you know, to, to our students as well. So to kick it off, I think we have to start with family separation policy. That was such a powerful part of the film um, and, and something that you, know, you had to live under a rock in 2018 to, to not be aware of what was happening in the country. Um, you know, and I know it's not isolated to the time we were hearing about it kind of in the main media. So, so I do want to speak about that too. But since we've got a broad audience, you know, and we've advertised this for, you know, law students, non-law students, it might be helpful just to kind of break it down a little bit about what was going on that led up to that, that crisis of family separation in 2018. 
Yeah, sure. Well, thank you, Anne, and thank you, Kate, for having me. Um, this is really nice to, to be talking to all of you. Um, yeah, so family separation dates way back and unfortunately is still an ongoing um, saga. What happened was in the fall of 2017, we began hearing from people that children were being separated from their parents at the border. We weren't sure exactly what was happening, the scope of it or, or the mechanics of it. So we started calling around and it became clear that there were families being separated. We weren't, but again, we weren't sure how many, what the ages were, what the justification was. Um, we were pretty sure it was happening in sufficient numbers to, to sue by January and then began trying to look for actual parents to talk to. In February, I went out to San Diego to visit Miss L. For those of you who saw the film, she was the woman in the, who, in the film who is our name, lead plaintiff and was reunited with her child and talked to her. Um, and it was just horrifying. She explained that she had been, she had three months, four month journey from the Congo, um, walking barefoot hundreds of miles, eating out of garbage cans, begging for food, no money, her and her seven year old daughter. They got here, they applied for asylum lawfully, meaning they went to port of entry, they didn't sneak in the country. And after a few days here in a detention center, they brought her into a separate room from her daughter and she all of a sudden heard her daughter screaming, mommy, mommy, don't let them take me away. When I visited her in the San Diego detention center, she had been there three months separated from her daughter, three to four months. She was gaunt, hadn't been eating, hadn't been sleeping. And we decided we needed to file immediately for her because it would take another few weeks to file a national class action, which was our intention at that point. We filed the case for her and the government said, well, yes, yeah, she did come legally and apply for asylum, but we didn't think it was really her daughter. And we said, why not? And they said, because she didn't have any papers. Well, of course she didn't have anything by the time she got here. And we said, you know, did you do a DNA test? No. Does you have any reason to believe other than she doesn't have papers that she's not the daughter, given that she was begging and screaming for her mommy? No. The judge said, well, you need to do a DNA test. Of course, it, be, it was positive, um, was a match. We then, two weeks later, fought a national class action. And at that point, we thought maybe there were three to 400 families that have been separated. We're hoping that Miss L's daughter was an aberration, that there weren't other kids who were that young, seven years old. Um, by the time we had a hearing in May of 2018, New York Times had reported that there were probably 700 families separated. By the time we got the ruling, but that was also, you know, speculation. By the time we got the ruling in Ju June of 2018, the government admitted that there were 2,800 families who were still separated. Um, and we then began the process of trying to reunite all those families. 400 of whom were, had been deported without their children. And we came up with a plan that the, the judge accepted to reunite the children under five within 14 days and the remainder within 30 days, um, both deadlines of which the government, the government missed. Six months later, a report, an internal investigative report by HHS said those 2,800 are not the whole story that even before those 2,800, there were many, many more children separated who the government did not report to the court or to the ACLU or to Congress or the, pu the public the press. And so we went back to court. We had a fight with the government to get those names. It turned out there were another 1,556 children who had been separated early on in the Trump administration. Um, and we finally got a list of those, of those children and the phone numbers and addresses were largely stale. We began calling them to try and find those families. We reached a few hundred of them, but ultimately the phone numbers were too stale at that point, too many years back. Um, so we had to start going door to door to try and find the families in Central America. 
unfortunately, then COVID hit and we have not been able to continue that search. So there are still hundreds of families who we haven't found yet. Um, the, the likelihood is that most of those parents were deported without their children. Some will then choose to have their child brought back to Central America. We're hoping we can get some of the, fa the parents back to the U.S. to rejoin their children in the U.S. But what's likely to happen is that many of those families will end up being permanently separated because they will believe it's too dangerous to bring their child back to Central America. And that's the agonizing decision that a lot of the parents have had to make is that now that they're back in Central America and it's still so dangerous for their children to be brought back, especially those who are gang recruitment age, will likely choose to leave their children in the U.S. and be permanently separated. The other, so that, that search continues and we'll have to pick up once in those countries it's safe and we're allowed to go continue going door to door, our mm -hmm. partners in Central America. The other thing that's continuing to happen is that the, the government is not systematically separating children anymore because the court put an end to that, but they are still separating children based on their claim that a, the, a particular parent is too dangerous to be with their child. And what we have found out is that those could be based on the most minor crimes. For example, a theft offense, a nonviolent theft offense from 15 years ago. Um, and that's been over a thousand children separated that way. So we are trying to put an end to that at the same time, trying to find the children that were previously separated. All in all, the Trump administration has separated at least 5,400 children that we know of, um, you know, three to 400 of whom are under five years old. And I, and I think, um, you know, as, as you saw in the movie, you know, the numbers tell one story but at the end of the day, you know, each child is their own individual stories. And it's really sort of that human dimension of each family that is so horrific, you know. And, and so I, I, there's just a number of stories that continue to haunt me. And they may not even be objectively the most egregious situations. But I think there's just little things that, that continue to sort of, I think about it. You know, one little boy... Um, a four-year-old boy from Honduras had glasses and his parents were from very modest means. They were able to afford to get him a pair of glasses and they were also able to scrape up the money to buy him a glasses case. And the glasses case became the biggest thing in their life because they knew they might not be able to buy a second pair of glasses if they broke. And when they came to take him away, he was fortunately wearing his glasses, but he wasn't able to go get his glasses case. So all day long, the mother just keeps thinking about, well, does my little boy have any place to put his glasses that are safe? Have they broken? Can he still see? Will they get him a new pair of glasses if they break? You know, another father explaining that he knew they were going to come and take his seven-year-old son away, and he just asked, can I have a few seconds to try and brace him for what's going to happen? They wouldn't give him the time. They just screamed out, we're taking him now. The little boy's clinging to his father saying, what's happening? You know, an 18 month old baby being put in a car and taken away without the mother even being able to comfort the 18 month old. Um, you know, it's just one story after another. And so it's been, you know, and I, as I've said publicly before, I've been doing this work for nearly 30 years. This is by far the worst thing that I have seen. Yeah, the, and that actually, so I want to come back in, in a minute to sort of some of the policy explanations for this, because I think um, it's important to sort of break those down in terms of what, why the Trump administration said they were doing this versus kind of the choices that they really, that they had um, and that, that existed. But, but to your last point, and that's the first question that kind of, that came in is, you know, it was clear from the movie itself and then your comments now that, that this case had a big impact on you. And, and that, that was a question from one of our students is, is how do you manage that and sort of compartmentalize that work, you know, given, given the marathon, you know, that, that, is, that, that brings these demands? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I think there's a few aspects to it. You know, one question that I get asked and, and my colleagues get asked a lot these days is, 
are you exhausted? You know, and it is by far the busiest time I've ever had. I mean, it's just literally every week the Trump administration is doing something that's fundamentally trying to change the immigration system. So there has, it's just been nonstop flying around the country for four years and sheer exhaustion. And I think the only thing that ultimately allows you to overcome that exhaustion is the clients. You know, every time I get so tired and I feel like I just need a break or I'm just too drained. And obviously you're going to, you know, have to do that once in a while, but then you, you see one of these parents and that their life is literally on the line. Um, and it's just, it rejuvenates you to see how hard they're fighting um, and their courage, but you also just feel like I can't, you know, let them down. And that's obviously, you know, difficult to, over the long period, I mean, the question that everyone asked now is, well, what if there's another four years of Trump, can you actually sustain that pace, you know, no matter how much the clients are, are you know, motivating you. But the other aspect, I think, and what the students question to get is, you know, is the emotional aspect. And usually I'm able to just sort of put it aside. I mean, there are hard moments. I think this was by far the hardest for me. And I think I was constantly sort of projecting onto my own children. And one of the things I'll just tell you sort of about the movie is that, you know, you saw in the movie a lot of other kids in the movie. And my kids were filmed a lot, spent a lot of hours. My younger son dragged in front of the camera, my older son fine with it. But ultimately, the focus groups, I'm sure the filmmakers may say I'm not supposed to say this out loud. We won't tell them. But ultimately, in the focus groups, people said, you can't show these kids, you can't show him hanging out with his kids, hugging his kids, because it's too jarring to have Levy looking for these children and then being enjoying his own children. So they cut out all those scenes. Um, and I think for me though, it, it, but it was a real sort of, I, you know, hugged my children that much tighter um, during this whole period. I think it really did affect me in a ways that other cases haven't. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm sure I'll think about it for a long time. And there's just, you know, it was just, it was hard. I mean, um, I don't I don't know that I have had any great answers to that. I think we are now as a public interest community and in also the ACLU focusing more on that. And we met with a psychologist from Yale who specializes in this about, you know, secondary trauma to lawyers. Unfortunately, I missed that because I was working, which, you know, is sort of the cruel irony of it, of it all. But, but I think it's, you know, a good question for people to ask. And for you young lawyers who are going to become public interest lawyers, I think you will be much more savvy about it than we were when we started our careers. I think we didn't think about it enough, but it, but it does take its toll. And I think for me, the children's aspect, so much more than, than other things. I mean, you know, just little things, there's even in the movie you see me in Tijuana talking to a father, but what they didn't show is that his 10 year old boy who had been taken from him was there and we got him reunited and he was there. And after the little boy was nine years old was sitting intently watching, listening. And after the father walked away, the little boy summoned up all his courage and came up to me and put out his hand and shook my hand and said, thank you for helping our family. I hope you will, still help our family, you know, and just like thinking about the courage it takes for a nine-year-old boy to summon up that kind of strength and courage to thank a strange man. Um, so I know I'm sort of going on and on about it, but, you know, it did, I think it did more than, you know, and I've been doing it a long time and you never get desensitized, but you do learn to compartmentalize. But I think this is one where I had a much harder time. Yeah. It. Yeah. I mean, you know, obviously not not doing that work. I've, I've taken students to the Family Detention Center under the Obama administration right. in Texas, you know, and I want to touch on that a little bit um, as well. But um, that scene where Ms. Al reunites with her daughter, I mean, I almost woke my kids up, you know, so that I could hug them in that moment because it's so clear um, in that reuniting, you know, in their, in, in, 
in their experience, the, the um, depth of the pain that they're going to have to overcome and that they were, you know, that they were going through just in every moment of that separation. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. I mean, I think reunification is not the end of it because the kids are so traumatized. And so there are, you know, various actions being taken to get the parents trauma relief help. We have, a, and we have a national lawsuit going a second lawsuit suing individual members of the administration from sessions on down for monetary relief, but also to create a medical fund. Because what's happened is, the do and the doctors have explained that the children are now probably gonna be irreparably or almost irreparably harmed from the trauma, that their, their sense of um, safety is, is cracked. You know, when you're four years old, the only reason the world doesn't scare you at every turn is because you think your parents can protect you. And when that shattered, your sense of vulnerability is just becomes deep seated probably for the rest of your life. You know, one of the first families we got reunited when I went to visit them in Virginia, where they, they went when they were released, the mother said the little four year old boy just keeps asking, are they gonna come and take me away again in the middle of the night? You know, and they're just the feeling of vulnerability. Um, and the other things I think the parents are really traumatized as well. You know, what happened was that the parents are feeling so guilty about what happened and their children are also coming back and understandably so angry at their parents because the children were not old enough to understand why their parents didn't stop this. So, you know, there'd be a four-year-old boy or being taken away and screaming, mommy, don't let them take me away. And he's watching his mother watch this and not taking any action, but too young to understand his mother couldn't stop it. So when, he, when the children come back, their first questions to their parents are, didn't you love me enough to keep me? Didn't you, why didn't you stop them from taking me? And so building that relationship back up between the parent and child is gonna take a long time. And some of the children, were just babies and don't even recognize their parents when they come back. So that's a whole you know, other yeah. level of trauma. Well, one of the other questions we got in, you know, sort of picking up from, from your um, conversation about sort of where we stand now is, is what happens to the children whose parents, you know, opt to leave them in the United States with the hope that they'll have a safer, better future and, and don't reunite with them back in their home countries. How, how is the, what's the system that is going to sort of care for them on this side? So what happens is they're given to a sponsor and, you know, hopefully it's someone who they've met before or a very close family member, but it can, on the other end of the spectrum, it could be someone, a fourth uncle they've never met or a foster home. What we found is that the parents who are choosing to leave their children in the U.S. are often, A, the, the older children who, if they come back to Central America, are going to be forced to be put in, be forced into a gang or killed. And also the children who have a closer relative in the U.S. who the parent feels will actually take care of them. Um, the younger children who don't, who may not be as, in as much danger if they come back and or don't have someone close to them. But, you know, they're going to grow up maybe with an aunt or an uncle if they're lucky, maybe not. And I think it's going to be, um, you know, it's going to be a crapshoot. It's one of those sort of realities of the immigration experience. Um, and, you know, one father in Guatemala said, I can't believe I may never see my son again, but he's 16 and the gangs know about him. And if he comes back, it's over for him. And so just making that brutal, agonizing decision to leave their children um, in the U.S. Yeah. Well, so so then sort of stepping a little bit back in, in time to one of the things that was kind of all over the, the um, you know, all over the media in response to images of this just horrific um, experience was statements about, well, we have to, the law requires this. Right. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, what those choices really were? And, and now, as, as Anne mentioned, we're learning this week, 
some of what those decisions were, were really about and who was behind them. Yeah. So you're right. The government tried to justify it by saying, well, Congress passed a law saying people can't come here illegally. All we're doing is following the law, prosecuting those people. And once we prosecute the parent, everyone agrees the child can't go into jail with them. So they necessarily have to be separated. And there are three parts of it, at least three parts that are wrong. First of all, not everyone came here illegally who had their child taken. What you heard from the administration is, oh, we're only taking um, children away if their parents are, came illegally and are being prosecuted. Ms. L showed up at a port of entry and applied lawfully. And the justification there was not, we have to prosecute her, but we don't believe that it's really her child. So we're just gonna take the child away. So that's the first part of it. The second part is even for parents who crossed illegally, that is something that prior administrations did not prosecute, especially if they were asylum seekers and especially if they had families. I mean, everybody knows that there's prosecutor discretion. You know, you would never prosecute a US citizen for a misdemeanor if she was the sole caretaker of her child and send her to jail, right? And, and leave the kid all by herself. So the government did not have to prosecute these cases. And we now know and the New York Times further, you know, confirmed it, that they prosecuted not, not just simply knowing that a byproduct would be separation of the kid, but precisely because they wanted the kids separate. That was the reason they actually exercised their prosecutor discretion to, to put these parents in jail. But the third point, and this is one we made in court is, look, even if you want to assume that prosecuting an asylum seeking parent with their child is lawful. You can prosecute them, but these are misdemeanors. The parent was getting out of jail in 24 to 48 hours. It was basically time served, right? And what we said to the judge was, well, even if you want to accept that they can prosecute these parents, when they walk out of jail, if that's the reason their kid was taken from them, why are they not getting their child back when they walk out of jail? What's the justification then? And the government had no justification. And one of our other lead plaintiffs, not Ms. Sell, who was prosecuted, they said, well, look, she was prosecuted. We couldn't put the kid in jail. And we said, well, look, you didn't have to prosecute her, but even if you wanted to prosecute, it's been nine months. Where's her child? And, you know, and the judge said, what is going on? You know, okay, maybe you're gonna prosecute these families. And, you know, we just said, judge, you don't even need to rule on that. I mean, it's now clear from the evidence that they did it precisely so they could take the child, but why were they not giving the children back? And the, the reason is because they had a plan to separate the children, but they had no intention, no plan to ever reunite the children. And on top of that, when it came time to actually reunite them and the judge ordered them to do it, they candidly admitted they didn't actually keep track of all the families. And it took an enormous amount of work to figure out which parent went with which child. And that, so the whole notion that they just, well, we had to prosecute is just absolutely wrong. They, 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 first, they took children away who were not prosecuted. Second, they didn't have to prosecute. And third, even if they were going to prosecute, as soon as that parent walked out of jail after 48 hours, they should have given the kid back. Their kids were not being given back for months and months and months. And what they truthfully were hoping is the parent would become so distraught, they would give up and say, I want to be deported. And then maybe they'd find the child to, to put on the plane with the parent. Maybe they wouldn't find the child. But the main thing is they wanted the parents to give up and they wanted the message to go to Central America. Don't come here because you'll have your child taken away. I remember when when that news broke that they actually had no tracking mechanism um, yeah. and how, um, I mean, how unbelievable that was, how devastating, I mean, it just the, the, even just saying those that right now I, I, is unbelievable. I mean, it just was such a source of shame for me personally in my country and my government, you know, but, but then just pain at thinking about what that process was going to look like. Um, I think that that prompted, I think your, your discussion just prompted another question um, from students of, do you think that there's going to be some sort of 
proceeding or action to hold this, that, this administration accountable for, for crimes against humanity in some way? Are we going to see sort of international um, human rights law coming into play in, in what these, these policies were intended to do? Yeah, that's another good question. And I think a lot of people are rightly asking now. So I think, you know, there's three possibilities. One is the civil suit we've brought in. Others are trying to bring um, for money damages against the individuals responsible in the government. The second would be maybe potentially criminal prosecution. I don't anticipate that happening. I mean, obviously, the Trump administration is not going to prosecute themselves, and I don't anticipate a Biden administration doing that. The third is whether any international um, bodies are going to try and do anything. I think it's possible, but I think probably, as you all know, maybe the students know even better than I do, you know, the likelihood that that will produce so anything concrete is unlikely. But there was definitely absolute outcry from the international community, including the Pope who spoke out on it twice. I mean, for the Pope to speak out on a specific immigration policy is, is really unheard of and twice, at least twice, it, but I don't know whether anything concrete is going to come out of any of these international bodies. Well, I think transitioning a little bit to sort of um, the way that the ACLU um, thinks about bringing litigation and the strategy that that you use in sort of you know choosing um, these impact cases and and it sounds like you know this was a case where you saw the, the, the need in Ms. L to, to immediately respond and then in concert kind of look at a way to broaden the impact of, of that work. Um, can you talk a little bit about how cases come to you, you know, how you guys, how, how you make choices among them and how you sort of work in coalition with others or you know, how you think about sort of broader movements and alliances? Yeah. So I actually think it's the most important part of our work is deciding what cases to bring um, because the cases are so big and last for so long and the resources are so limited. I mean, you know, the ACLU has more resources than just about or maybe more than any other civil rights organization, but nonetheless still limited. You know, there's 12 of us litigating immigration the whole nationally at the whole country and cases can last for a long time and so every time we make a wrong decision about what case to bring it can really impact us and so I think and one of the, the problems we used to have much more time to figure out well let's bring this case or that case and strategize about it and because the Trump administration is doing everything so quickly and we feel the need for a lot of reasons to push back immediately. We've had to make very quick decisions about where to use our resources. Um, but ultimately, it is the most important thing we do. And, you know, I don't know that there's any one criteria, but some of the things that we look at are how much bang for the buck are we going to get? Meaning, you know, how much impact can we do? How many people can we help? But also, is there going to be lasting structural impact? You know, is this a situation where it's going to help people for a short amount of time, but it's not going to create any lasting law? Because if it's not going to create lasting law, then it really has to, you know, some kind of structural constitutional principle that's going to last and transcend this case. Then it really has to be a case where we're going to impact, have, help a significant number of people. So even if it's not creating law going forward, it is stopping a policy that could be hurting 10,000, 100,000 people. Um, the other thing we're looking at is, you know, is our expertise and our, our niche, you know, sort of, is it necessary? Or can other people do it equally well? Because then maybe we step back and are other people doing it because there's no reason to use our resources duplicatively. Um, we then look to see, you know, what kind of coalitions make sense. Is this something the ACLU should do alone? Are there other groups that want to be involved and we do it together? We also, as our resources get stretched thinner and thinner, do we want to bring in a law firm to help? Um, 
the last part of it, you know, and I think is, is the most difficult, I think, and it's becoming an increasingly important part of it, is how do you fit into a sort of broader movement um, among legal organizations, but just even more broadly than that. And, you know, that's something that we need to figure out and are constantly figuring out. Um, because I think most civil rights lawyers will tell you that to, to really create lasting structural impact, it needs to be more than just litigation in the courts. You need a real public movement. And I think that's one of the things that happened with family separation. We were able to create that movement and it really made a difference. So you wanna plug into whatever kind of movement there is or help create a movement. Um, and you also wanna make sure that whatever you're doing is ultimately in line with what groups on the ground think is important. Do they think this is important? Do they want our help? Um, and all, I think all those things matter. And then the last part is sort of, you know, developing a public narrative around the case. What, what's the narrative going to be? Is it, is it going to make sense, not just in court, but are we going to be able to sell it more broadly publicly? Because all this became so high profile in the immigration area. And, you know, that's one of the real challenges. It may seem within, you know, this may be a self-select group watching the movie tonight that we all feel like immediately all these things Trump is doing are horrendous, but the administration does have sound bites that appeal to people, maybe not on family separation, which did create an outcry both from the left and the right, but other things like at the border, are there just too many people coming to our country, too many asylum seekers, those types of things. And so working on how do you create a public narrative to push back that, that you can, rebut the administration, which has, you know, the president has a lot of people listening to him. And sometimes it's much easier to have a sound bite that sounds intuitively right from his side than it is to explain from our side why. And so I think all those things we take into account, um, but ultimately picking the right cases is so critical. And it's been hard with the Trump administration because each thing I would say that we are involved in 15 cases now, any one of which would be the biggest in any other time would be the case for that year. And we would almost be thinking about nothing else. And I probably 15 is way underestimating it. You know, yeah, definitely underestimate. I mean, each week we're, and so, and then a lot of times something is so egregious, but we say, should we sue on that? Because there may be something even more egregious next Monday, and then we don't have the resources to sue on that. So I know that's a long answer, but I do think it is one of the things that we spend an enormous amount of time on um, because the wrong decisions, you know, I have, I have had cases the last 10 years. And so you make the wrong decision about how much bang for the buck you're going to get from that. And you tie up half your staff for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, Sort of being mindful, mindful on the time, and I think this will help us kind of talk about a, a couple other questions coming in. I do want to switch to the the travel ban or the Muslim ban, you know, at least to, at least briefly here tonight. Um, in particular, you know, I think about the scene where you're about to go on TV to talk about family separation and realize the Supreme Court decision, you know, in one of these other major cases, um, and and one of the first, you know, actions. Um, against the Trump administration comes down. Um, and so, you know, can you, can you talk at least a little bit about how that process played out from sort of day eight of the administration, you know, to sort of where we ended up with the Supreme Court? Um, and, I, and I think, you know, that's a big question. And in, in part, if you, if you can address um, or comment on why you think things changed, you know, over time and with every sort of appeal so that, you know, you have this major victory on day eight. And I, I know the policy evolved as well. But by the time we get to the Supreme Court, that case feels very different. And they, and they also come out, you know, not where you started with the district court. Yeah. So I think there's, I mean, there's a lot packed into your good question. Um, you know, we ultimately, as I think everyone probably, you know, you know knows, people saw the movie, we lost 5-4 in the Supreme Court. 
um, you know, the Supreme Court is more conservative than a lot of the lower courts. I mean, that's one thing and I don't think I'm telling anybody anything they don't know already. Um, but I do think, you know, I think I say two things quickly is one is we delayed implementation of the policy a fair amount of time. And, you know, there are a lot of people say to us, well, you've won a bunch of cases against the Trump administration, but you've lost a bunch. And it's true. But on the other hand, how many people might have been harmed in the interim? You know, sometimes that may be all you can do. And so, but the other part of it is that the policy softened while it was still horrendous at the end, it did move to a third iteration and that's what the Supreme Court upheld. And so it did get better. I mean, it still was horrendous, but so, you know, I wouldn't say it was a total loss. I mean, it was a bad loss, but I guess the other thing I would say is, you know, sometimes we go into these fights, especially with the current Supreme Court, knowing that we may lose. And so then you have that hard question in front of you, and this goes to selecting cases, are there some issues in some cases you just have to fight no matter what? You know, if we only took cases we knew we were going to win, we'd be taking a lot less cases. And I don't, I, I just think that that's one of those where we would have, even if they said to us, you're going to lose four years from that. I don't think, you know, I don't know that a lot of people necessarily thought we were going to win, but it's just sometimes you just need to fight those cases. And, you know, some of that is what's going on now. It's just, you need to show people in the United States, you're going to fight back. You need to show the affected communities you're going to fight. And you just need to let the administration know you're going to fight. I mean, we know that the administration now thinks about whether they're going to issue a particular policy, thinks about is the ACLU or other groups going to sue immediately. And even if that delays the implementation of the policy for six months, it's better than people being hurt during those six months. Yeah, I mean, that was a stinging defeat. It wasn't totally unexpected, but I don't think anybody in our office feels like it was a wasted fight. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think going through all of that time that the, the that that you all won through delay and that the Trump administration had to keep backpedaling on as a result, you know, certainly in um, doing cases with, you know, asylum seekers in the Charlotte Immigration Court just to take things, you know, a little further down from the, the U.S. Supreme Court. I mean, that's, that's a big part of what we're winning is time with right. family, you know, and strategies for law reform well right. down the road. Right. Um, so, so I think, I, I think speaking to the sort of cases you have to take regardless and maybe moving into claims you have to make regardless. Um, there, there's a conversation, you know, with um, Dale Ho, the ACLU voting rights attorney about claims based on pretext and what we're hearing from the Trump administration um, versus sort of the more technical legal arguments that might be going on in the claims. And that played out, you know, in, in the Muslim ban litigation, which had both kind of the technical, did you follow the rules when you did this correctly, plus the sort of racial, you know, and, and religious animus elements. And we saw that also in, in the DACA litigation. Right. Um, and, and so I'm, I'd love to hear from you how you think about making the, the role that making those claims about this is what's being said, this is what the tweets are, you know, it won in the vote, you know, it, it won in the voting rights case, you know, it, it hasn't carried the day in other places, but, but to me, it seems valuable to make and, you know, hear about how you make those decisions. Yeah, I think each case is, is a little different. Um, what we always try and do is create the atmospherics around it that the administration's not really being upfront about their motivations. Um, you know, and we're doing that now in what's called the Title 42 litigation, where they're barring all asylum seekers, including children, from entering the country based on the claim that it's necessary for COVID safety reasons. And there's been articles that have come out in the last
last week saying the White House overruled the CDC and CDC didn't actually believe that we need to keep asylum seeking children out of the country for safety reasons that they could have been quarantined very easily. Um, so we always try and create that atmospheric. My own feeling is that there are not going to be a lot of cases where that's your best claim in the immigration area because it's very hard in the immigration area. I think what you can do a step short of that is what happened in DACA with the APA and arbitrary and capricious that the administration didn't spell out their reasons carefully, which is a way to get at motivation and pretext without the court announcing the president is racist or the administration's racist. Um, but you know, it's a hard, it's a hard thing because there are people out there who want us to sort of name it. And we all know that this administration has been going after people of color um, across the board and that's what's going on. Um, but how front and center you make it in litigation is a tricky question, you know, and whether if that's your only claim, then so be it. But it often will not be, at least in the immigration area, the claim because it implicates, it may prove too much and almost the whole immigration system could fall in some respects. And that's not a step that this Supreme Court may be willing to make as opposed to a one-off about the census where, you know, it's not the president of the United States. But I also think, you know, there, there may be the claims you bring in court, but then there's the public narrative around the case. And so you may feel like, well, let's at least make sure the public narrative is naming what's going on. Um, but I find that to be one of the hardest um, issues for us now is how much to make race front and center in these immigration cases, you know, and to actually just say to the judge, this is a racist policy and you need to stay it and strike it down. Um, and whether that will survive in the Supreme Court, you know, is tough. I don't have we had easy answers, but I think it's the mm -hmm. right question to be asking. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a sort of mul speaking to multiple audiences element of it too, right. and sort of what you're standing up up for, you know, in that process, as you were mentioning before. Yeah. Well, we only have a few precious more moments with you. And so I do want to make sure we speak to um, just more sort of general conversations around being a public interest lawyer. Um, and, you know, we, I remember in law school sort of looking at the trade offs that public interest careers had. Um, I'm super fortunate to be in the place that I am. Um, but those, those can be tough trade offs to, to think about. Um, as a, as a law student. Um, and so, you know, want to make sure we hear kind of down the road, right? Um, how you, you talked a little bit about what's motivating, but kind of what else you might sort of share about, about a career in public interest lawyering. Right. So, I mean, obviously you can tell from me that I feel like it's a rewarding experience. I, you know, I don't want to, um, people have personal reasons why they, do you want to go into public interest or can't? And it could be financial, it could be any one of a number of reasons. So I don't, you don't want to get into that. I just want to, I guess I'd say a, a couple of quick things is one is even if you're not going to go to a nonprofit and you're going to go to a law firm or a big law firm, it doesn't mean you can't keep your hands in this. All of the law firms now for the, are, are doing an enormous amount of pro bono work, um, more so than ever. And so I think it's very easy to be doing pro bono work at a firm. And so I think there's, you know, if you go to a firm, but you're interested in pro bono to do it. And I also, I think there's a misconception that if you go to a firm, you can never go to a public interest firm because public interest place like the ACLU will say, oh no, you used to be at that big law firm. It's not true, but I would suggest that if you do go to a big firm, keep whatever contacts you have going join a bar committee to meet people, to keep your hands in it, do pro bono work, so that if you go to apply someplace like the ACLU if after three or four years at the firm, you're not just sort of showing up, you don't know anybody, you've never worked on any cases, that kind of thing. So just keep your hands in it, because there's nothing wrong, obviously, with going to a firm for any reason. You like the work they do, or financial, or whatever, but if you, th you know, do the pro bono wherever you are, 
you can you can keep your hands in it. The other thing I would say, um, and I, I sort of, I feel pretty strongly about this, is that I think there's a misconception out there among a lot of young lawyers, law students, about public interest work, and in that as long as you're passionate about the work. That's all that's going to matter in getting a job to show that you're committed and passionate. And the truth is, as you all probably know, public interest jobs are harder to get than law firm jobs because there's just so many fewer jobs. So you really need to, as bad as it is, you really need to focus on your grades, on doing well in school. It's just not, you know, it's just a hard, those are hard jobs to get. And like anywhere else, people look at credentials. It's not just commitment. I mean, it's both, but you can't just, right? And so then the, the last thing I want to say, which I think maybe is the most important thing I want to just end on is it's really important to become a good lawyer early in your career, a good technical lawyer. Um, it's even more important in the public interest world. It's becoming harder and harder to win civil rights cases, especially now with the, the bench changing. So go in the early part of your career, someplace where you're gonna get mentored by really good lawyers and learn how to be a good lawyer. Once you learn how to be a good lawyer, you can do anything, but it's very hard to become a good lawyer much later in your career if you don't develop any skills. So you know, just being much more concrete, if you're faced with two job opportunities and one is exactly in the subject matter you want to do, maybe immigration, but the lawyers aren't particularly good, or you could go do housing work somewhere else, which is not necessarily your particular interest, but the lawyers are spectacular lawyers where they're really going to teach you how to be a good lawyer. I, I would strongly think about taking that job with the good lawyers. I mean, I would much prefer when I'm getting a recommendation call to get the call from the really good lawyer who says this, this young lawyer has become spectacular, great brief writer, great on her feet, and she will pick up immigration in a second. That's a subject matter is easy to pick up than a shitty immigration lawyer who I know hasn't taught this person anything and the young lawyer comes, well, I know immigration law, but if they don't know how to really litigate, that's a way bigger detriment for me than being a good lawyer. So really, really try and become good lawyers at an early stage, because then you can do anything. And it's, you know, it's absolutely critical. It's just so hard to win these cases now. You need to be a good technical lawyer. If you're not going to be a lawyer, the same thing goes policy advocacy you know, with someone who really knows what they're doing. Um, yeah, that's, that's great advice. And I think, you know, maybe just sort of the last logical question is, you know, if there are opportunities with the ACLU and we're going to have, you know, we've, we've had speakers regularly from the local affiliate of the ACLU, um, you know, to, to seek out some of those opportunities during law school, you know, whether over the summers or, um, during the school year? Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, there's always summer positions um, and those people start filling really early. Um, and so I would encourage people definitely to apply. We would love to get more applications from Duke, you know, summer people. But then I think during the year, to the extent that there are formal externships with Duke, but also we are always looking for a student just to help out on a big case. Um, you know, we had 20 on a Supreme Court case I argued last March, we had 25 students from a variety of law schools all over the country helping. And so there's always those possibilities. And I think, you know, you can, you, you could email me and say the student is interested. And, um, you know, the only thing we ask is that you're actually responsible because we really need the help. And so we can't just have you assume, oh, well, I'm sure three other people are working on this is part of the brief so I can just sort of goof off and put it on my resume. Like we really will use the work and even in a Supreme Court brief, but we're definitely always happy to, you know, to try and, and, and have students help during the year. So I think all this, and then obviously after school, um, you can apply for fellowships and, and that kind of thing. And that's a conversation we could have if you're doing the public interest stuff mm -hmm. with students who are interested in, at another time. Um, 
or you can always just email me and, and you know, and say the student's interested or, you know, but yeah, I mean, we really rely on students. And I feel like one of the things that happens is we don't, it's just things move quickly and we don't get applications from as many places as we hope to. And so I think it would be great if we could start having that kind of connection with Duke where we're getting. Well, that is great to hear and very exciting for us too. Um, and, and thank you so much for spending the last hour with us. Um, it was a, just a real privilege for me um, and especially after watching uh, the fight, you know, just a really fantastic, inspiring film um, and, and keeps you in the fight, as they say. So, so that thank I, you. So thank much. you. To, to be with you again, we go back a long way and Anne, um, thanks. And for all the students, good luck with everything. And I'm always happy to, to talk to people. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. And we'll see everybody Bye. soon. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Kate. Thank you. Bye, Thank Anne. you so much, Lee. Good, good seeing you both. Yeah, thank you. You too. It was really, really fun. Good. Okay.